And our organization, to just to end off this part about polypharmacy and why it's an issue, I mean, we're not necessarily here to, to um, our focus is the health and not the money, but these medications do cost a lot. It costs to society the cost of the actual meds, but also the consequences that need to be treated after. Once you end up in the hospital, we need to treat you for that reason, etc. Um, and so as a society, we, we need to think about where we're putting our money <laughs> and maybe we should consider, I don't know, changing that. If we can fund safer alternatives, because often what patients will tell us is, well, I don't necessarily want to take a medication, but I don't have access to all those other ther like physiotherapy or a massage or these other strategies. I'm just by myself, so it's hard in terms of um, access to these re to these therapies for me. So what we're trying to do as an organization is to raise awareness about the effectiveness of these alternatives, the ones that have been demonstrated to be effective, and to encourage funding. Um, in terms of access for, for individuals or psychotherapy for anxiety and et cetera. We're not saying they should replace medication, but they should be offered as well so that there is an option for individuals. And we know that having suffering from medicine harm can lead to the loss of independence. And this is where this issue becomes, and just to end off before, before we go to the break, just want to tie it back to the current health situation with COVID. We've seen how hard it's hit us in Quebec, especially in the long-term care setting, and that was so sad. And what we want to do is to keep individuals at home as long as possible to avoid um, really having to be in this type of care setting for sure. And so what we, and everyone wants to stay at home the longest, as, as long as possible. So with the medication, we can do that, but let's make sure we use it wisely so it doesn't cause for an individual to fall at home, et cetera. So that's where medicine safety becomes so, so important. And we need to make sure that patients don't just take meds because they're prescribed and not ask questions. So the second part of my presentation is uh, more hands-on, as I mentioned initially. So we started off by talking about the issue. I gather that it can be maybe overwhelming. I'm, I've read uh, all of the questions that have been submitted. Thank you so much. They're all great questions. And I hope we'll be able to address them later. Um, and a lot of the points were, uh, one of the points was, you know, older adults um, either don't feel like they can be, the, the doctor is not going to listen to them. They feel like they are uh, kind of pushed away if they're ever sharing a concern. And I realized this is something that can happen and that happens, unfortunately. So the... Uh, what we need to be doing here is the uh, optics or how health is working today is changing slowly towards um, a partnership approach, we're hoping, between patients and health providers. But we know that it's not necessarily 100% of the time <laughs> applying to, to uh, the way that it's working right now. So there is no miracle to change the issue, uh, to change the situation, but there are things that patients, their caregivers, and um, anyone involved uh, around them can do, and hopefully we can move slowly in the right direction to uh, prevent harmful medication effects. So I realize that not necessarily feeling that we have the ear of the person necessarily op as open as we'd like, it is, it's a possibility for sure, but we can create a large-scale change, and I'll bring you down now to the name of our organization, and um, that's the solution that we're putting forth to prevent medicine harm. We are pre um, kind of raising awareness and just promoting in itself what is called deprescribing. So we're um, looking at the word in itself, and you can probably guess what it means just by looking at the two parts of the word, so D and prescribing. So deprescribing is the opposite of prescribing. So it means reducing or stopping medications that may not be beneficial or may be causing harm. So I guess the first point and the first concept that we're trying to teach is not every medicine needs to be taken forever at the same dose. So, and we need to be constantly reassessing them. The goal of deprescribing, what we're trying to do is to maintain or improve quality of life. And 
we are very clear on the fact that deprescribing must always be done as a team with doctor, nurse, pharmacist, health provider you trust. So deprescribing is specifically relevant to older adults, but it can be done at all age groups. But we know that as we age, we become more sensitive to medicine, as we discussed initially. We our risk benefit changes, the ratio on harm kind of becomes heavier with age, often cases. So deprescribing needs to be kept in everyone's mind. Maybe it's a possibility. And not be seen as necessarily, oh, my doctor's giving up on me. That is the last thing that we want people to think. It's actually that your doctor is thinking or your pharmacist is thinking about your quality of life before anything and thinking really that the deprescribing will benefit you in the end rather than um, the opposite. And our organization, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to raise awareness around the issue of over uh, medicine overuse. And we regroup um, organizations like Seniors Action Quebec and organizations that reach seniors everywhere in the country, health professionals, so associations of health professionals. We go and give conferences to doctors, pharmacists, etc. So we're bringing that information out as well in that format and governments, because we know that if policies aren't put in place, then it's going to be hard for um, individuals to uh, access these services. So we can just think about virtual care, just as an example. Um, I think before the pandemic, about 7% of, of people had reported having a virtual um, kind of encounter with their health profession, with their doctor in the last year or so, and it went up to like 50% after uh, once they were looking at stats, it was crazy. So, and that's because, well, <laughs> they started to be paid for. So the government started to fund doctors to uh, be on the phone with patients. So when we, we actually put the money where we need things to happen, things tend to happen. So that's where we need governments there, just as an example, perhaps to encourage professionals to look at the medication that people take and identify, um, which ones may not be needed anymore in a medication review. So that's just one example, but by putting in place policies, we can facilitate, we can make uh, deprescribing easier and more accessible. And our goals really are high uh, level goals are to raise awareness and eliminate the use of risky medications for older Canadians. And as I mentioned initially, we need to improve access to safer uh, therapies versus to and make sure there, the option is there. So that's, those are broad goals. And I understand that today you may be like, yeah, but how, what can I do in my life and the life of others that I live with, et cetera, um, or that are in my circle, social circles? Um, there are many things you can do, but I'd say the first is if you are taking a medication, a medication in general, what we want is uh, to have a, an appointment booked with your doctor, pharmacist, or nurse to question or to discuss the medication, to review it and ask if there could be any opportunities to deprescribe. So that I, this is really the point that we want to encourage is this is an ongoing discussion. So there are no specific like, oh, if you're on one, you need to go every X, Y, Y, Z years, et cetera. What we'd like to say usually is if you're on five or more, we want this to happen at least every year. Okay. And Actually, if you're on any medication, it should happen every year, but having a thorough review of your meds should happen at least yearly. And then every time there's a change in your meds, you should also be looking at them again and um, asking for a review to be made to make sure everything works uh, well together. We know that when the patients are not necessarily aware of what they take, that's where the issues and the medicine harm can happen. Um, an example would be when people leave the hospital, things change a lot and it's hard to track. Um, and that's where you can either have a duplication. We know that these periods, these transition periods are high risk. So that's when knowing what we take or having a list that's kept updated is, is very, very um, kind of, it, it makes a huge difference for patients. So um, booking that appointment today with COVID, it can happen by phone. Your doctor and your doctor, for example, has access to your file at the pharmacy. So they're able to see what you've been taking over the past year, at least for sure. And they have the update, most updated file 
normally if they have access to the DSQ, which is Dossier Santé Québec. The other point that I want to make is that nowadays in Quebec, um, there is in most clinics, there are pharmacists that are called, that are in what we call GM, family medicine groups. So FMG or a GMF en français, Groupe de médecine familiale. So if you have access to a GMF, you have access normally to a pharmacist today. That pharmacist is not dispensing any medications. That pharmacist is there to do just what I've described. So review medications and improve uh, medication therapy for patients there. So if you want to have access to that service and it is free, there are no charges, it's paid by the capsule, you just ask the clinic and often they accept self-referrals. I'm not saying that they'll take you in the next day, but these services are free and are, and are available for patients in the province. So you have different avenues. You could either talk with your, patient, your, your doctor on the phone today. Obviously, with COVID, it's going to be on the phone. So with your family doctor, having an appointment over the phone to discuss your medication, having a review, speaking with your community pharmacist, maybe the person that knows you the best that's dispensing your, pharmacy, your medication. So having that discussion there as well, or the family medicine group pharmacist, and as well as any other health provider that may be involved in your care, like nurses um, that could be there and someone that really knows you well. And when we're talking about having that discussion, what type of questions should you ask? We have created a list of five to, to uh, make this easier and to help prepare these types of discussions. So the first question is quite simple, is why am I taking this medication? You may already know. Um, you may be learning new things when you ask, once you ask the question, it may be surprised, uh, it may surprise you to hear the answer. So asking that question is firstly uh, essential. So often patients can be surprised to hear that, you know, this medication is used for uh, mood. They, they didn't think it was, or for nerve pain, they, they'd forgotten or had been taking it on it for so long that they had forgotten really. So always ask why that medication is there and then you can document it and keep track. Maybe you already know, but it's always um, good to ask. What are the potential benefits and harms of this medication? What, am I be what am can I expect from this medication here? So huge question, um, but asking it can be an uh, important conversation starter, which number three kind of falls under, which is specifically, can it affect my memory or could it cause me to fall? So uh, we, a lot of medications can affect both of these functions or these these categories here, memory and falls and balance. So asking it once again is crucial to um, really learn about these important parts because uh, we know these are very important to seniors. Can I stop or reduce the dose uh, of this medication? That's the question about deprescribing. So really asking about it is the best you can do. And if the answer is no, well, believe me, you will not have lost anything. It's just the question. You've asked it, you've gotten the answer, and you know why, you can ask why, um, what are we expecting from this? And you have the information there. Who do I follow up with and when? So that's the last question I'd say that we wanna encourage people to ask because if ever you're changing a medication after this conversation happens, then you'll want to have a process in place to um, track how things go. Because a lot of the medicine, you don't want to stop abruptly. We talk about sleeping pills, but a num number of them um, actually fall under that category as well. Because you'll get withdrawal effects. You'll have um, other si side effects that you don't want to have either. And then that'll cause other issues. So a lot of them have to be slowly, slowly reduced. And then you, you will want to know which ones and then have that discussion. And even if things don't change, you still have to have that conversation regularly. So wait, let's have it again in a year and see how things are going. So I've been told many times by patients, you know, I've been taking this, say, I don't know, medication for my thyroid gland for 25 years at the same dose. Why would I need to like change it? It's always been the same. Well, I always respond, well, you have an as an individual have changed. You have changed and your medicine may need to change as well with time. So that's why we need to monitor that closely. 
So these broad categories here, we know that patients that are more informed are, are better equipped and can prevent and flag issues before they become uh, bigger problems. So inform yourself. That's a huge part of how we can prevent medicine harm. Engage in a discussion with people around you, but also your health professionals um, that are involved within your care and discuss about options um, in terms of deprescribing and other therapies that are proven to work um, to treat, I don't know, anxiety, stress. Uh, we are under a lot of um, stress right now, pain, etc. <clears throat> options that are known to work, but may not necessarily entail medicine. Don't always expect to have a pill to solve an issue. If we're open to other approaches, we can certainly um, better approach them and um, approach them through a global perspective. And then spread the word about this topic, about this issue um, within your circles and within groups like these, Seniors Action Quebec, and talk about it with your, your uh, political representative. Because as I mentioned, we're putting in place the measures we, um, that can support these conversations and these discussions, then things will happen. And things need to happen in Quebec. Um, when we look at sleeping pill consumption in Quebec, we are the champions. We are the ones that use the most in older adults, so 65 plus. Look at that, one out of five. So these discussions really need to happen for us to really start seeing a difference happen in the, in the province. Um, so let's not stay there at the top. Hopefully we can reduce it in every, everywhere in the country for sure. But uh, yeah. I, coming from uh, living in Montreal here, I, I'm saddened to see this for sure. And to end my presentation and <laughs> to have uh, you perhaps react to this, this uh, program here, in Denmark, they didn't take any chances with sleeping pills and older adults. They saw what we saw. They saw that, I mean, driving motor vehicle accidents were up when people use sleeping pills. And they said, you know what? We're banished, we're putting a ban on driving and drinking, drinking and driving, but we're not, we need to be consistent and actually put in place programs and policies for sleeping pills and driving. Sleeping pills increase car accidents, especially in older adults. So we're taking charge of that. And what they did is the older adults, so 70 plus, I believe in that program, who were using sleeping pills were actually asked, either you keep the sleeping pill or you, uh, you keep the driver's license. You have to choose. If you're gonna take the sleeping pill, we will take away your driver's license. So imagine this happening in, in Quebec here in North America in itself. I, I don't see that happening ever, but yeah, that's just a, the way that their um, public health program approached it. And do you think it worked? Do you think that it helped reduce sleeping pill use in um, older adults? Well, for sure it did. It was very, very effective. Um, so their sleeping pill use went down by 66%. That took 10 years. It took a while. But yeah, very, very effective. 